Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me over from the UK. Uh, I work for a firm called Analysis Mason. Uh, we're a telecoms and media consulting firm, and what I'd like to do today is just give some international perspectives on convergence. Start off with some figures. Uh, these charts on the screen here are traffic through uh, two internet exchanges, one in the Netherlands, one in Germany, over the last few years. Uh, I thought it's worth just taking stock of this. I don't think there are many phenomena that have showed growth of around 100% per year. Um, the question that we face now in the converged world is, can this growth continue? I think the answer is yes. When, when you look at uh, rich media video services moving online, uh, for example, in the UK we have the BBC uh, iPlayer, its catch-up TV service or on-demand TV service has been phenomenally successful. And if you look how that consumption of those kind of services over the next few years might evolve, uh, some work we've done for Ofcom, which is the UK regulator, expects something like between 10 and 80 times the current traffic load on networks driven by uh, increasing consumption of TV. And that will continue to be fueled by the introduction of high definition services, which is just happening in the UK at the moment. Access of this content through the TV screen in the living room rather than th through a PC screen and more and more devices in the home being connected to a, a home uh, internet access point. And we see here we're expecting growth which is incredibly large and that will place huge stresses on current networks. I think we've heard the, uh, the qualitative arguments for investment in networks. This is just one recent study from April in the UK done by the London School of Economics uh, regarding uh, how broadband benefits economies, uh, di both direct and indirect benefits and jobs created uh, in uh, ICT and supporting industries. This is one of many studies that supports investment from a kind of public policy perspective. There are similar studies from the US and in uh, Asia as well. But it's not just about economic benefits. I think this is actually very difficult to prove uh, in detail. I think some of the more interesting things are social benefits and, uh, and other benefits. Uh, some examples here I've just listed on the screen. Uh, two, two very good um, communities in, in Madrid and Newnan in the Netherlands which support the elderly community We're on, on fiber networks, uh, letting them keep in touch with uh, relatives but also access to medical services. Uh, the Kindle, we've heard a lot about that already this morning, uh, but it, it, it has large type and audio for the poor sighted. So once again, it's, a, it's an inclusion benefit which goes beyond what uh, the private sector operators may initially be uh, think, uh, concerned about. And then some examples from uh, Senegal in Kenya where mobile has been incredibly powerful. The, the fixed networks there are generally underdeveloped. Uh, this example called Manobian Senegal, which is a, a text-based agricultural and fisheries market price service. Uh, it's had a huge impact on how the market works. It's disintermediated exploitation in the middle, middle ground of the market uh, and has had a huge impact. And two, two examples of mobile banking, MPs are in Gcash, one in the Philippines, one in Kenya. Um, these are in markets where traditional access to bank banks has been very limited or there's no credit or credit card system or check, etc. Th those systems don't exist. So using mobile as a way of uh, stimulating a new market or creating a new market has been very, very successful. And this isn't just about you know, DSL. This is about connectivity. And I think uh, the previous speaker's comments on that uh, ring very true here. It's not just about high-speed entertainment services. It's fair to say, though, that many markets are responding with new investments in networks. This is just uh, a, a summary at the top. There with a, the, the table at the top shows generally the incumbent ex-monopoly operators investing in fiber networks, not necessarily all the way to the home, but at least a, a one step up from where we are today. Uh, but there are some examples, for example, in France, where other operators are investing in fiber. Um, that's going to have very strong capital requirements and operators. This chart at the bottom is from the ITU. It shows total telecoms expenditure, uh, investment, both fixed and mobile. It's been relatively stable for these four markets over the last few years. 
for sure that's going to go up dramatically in terms of billions when access networks need to get in, uh, upgraded. The question really is timing, I think, given the economic climate. Does that happen in the next one or two years, or is it a more mid-term investment? But we know from work, uh, multiple studies on um, the economics of rolling out these networks, that next generation access will not go across the whole of a nation under private sector uh, funding alone. This is an extract from a piece of work we did for the UK government. It shows the cost of fibre to the home in the UK going to around 30 billion UK pounds sterling, that's to say 33 billion euros. And what's interesting about this result is the shape of the curve and how this ramps up very steeply as you move from the urban centers into the more rural population. Now, there are strategies to address rural populations, but the issue is how does that get financed? And, and the, the map on the right-hand side shows uh, the red areas, which are the areas that are very unlikely to get any kind of fiber investment uh, in the UK under commercial investment. Mobile broadband is clearly going to be important supporting rural. Uh, it's very important to bear in mind, though, that it's no replacement for fiber. That might not matter for many of the applications anyway, but we often hear mobile services being able to support incredibly high data rates. Just one thing to bear in mind, it's a shared resource there, and, and if lots of users are trying to download very rich media content over one base station, then it's unlikely you will get those peak rates you see in the press. And in fact, in a simple terms, this table shows that generally mobile technologies seem to lag fixed technologies by around one generation in terms of their performance capabilities. Now in the media world, this chart, I, I came across this chart this week. It's from the US. It shows the first decline in online advertising revenue over the last eight or nine quarters. Now, this is very important because there's a lot of talk about uh, new media supporting investment in new networks, for example. Already, we are seeing advertising spend tail off in the U.S. And the problem here is this places a very strong pressure on the business model that supports converged service investment. And in addition to that, there are lots of other questions. For example, the U.K. government is currently looking at this in its Digital Britain review, which is a ministerial-led uh, review of both telecoms and media, how the rights regime is being affected by convergence. Is there a role for technology standards and openness in this converged world? And finally, what's the role of public sector broadcasting in supporting uh, this in the longer term? So all of these things are currently being asked in my home market. And it's very clear to us uh, and many others that there is a risk of digital uh, exclusion uh, th this is a schematic that attempts to show that the quality of connectivity, this is not just speed. You heard the earlier speakers today talk about quality, um, the, the rapidness of the experience. And this, once again, varies depending on where you live, whether you're in urban centers or more rural areas. So this is a policy issue now. And I think we're seeing two very different strategies to address it. On the left-hand side, what I term here the universal service, universal service for broadband, where uh, national governments are looking at essentially raising the bar of what the minimum service of broadband is. So this is the dotted horizontal line. That's one approach that's been taken in France, it's been taken in Ireland, and it's currently being looked at in the UK. There are more ambitious projects, which I've termed here investing for the future, where that bar is going to be raised much, much higher. And this, I think, Australia is probably the best example where the Australian government has pledged around 43 billion Australian dollars to support fiber to around 90% of homes in Australia. And the US has a, si a very similar large-scale stimulation program, which is not just looking at relatively modest increases. It's a wholesale change on how the market operates. So my final comment on this is you know, what's required to really extract these benefits. It's not necessarily just about fiber, but what's clear to us um, that it needs very, very clear government strategy and policy at this point. This collision of these two markets presents lots of new challenges. Uh, and we, we clearly lots of governments are already looking at it as hard. 
Um, it needs a very supportive telecoms and media regulatory environment. I think that currently is in some kind of state of flux. There is a possible re-architecting or reshaping of the value chain between telecoms and media. This is a very difficult question in terms of how the business model works in the longer term. And finally, if we're going to address a lot of those rural difficult areas, it seems to me very likely that we will see some kind of public-private partnerships to deliver that. Thank you.